Sociology. Today we are going to start a new unit on sociological perspectives, the, the um, large sociological perspectives, which are conflict theory, functionalism, which are two competing perspectives, and then um, symbolic interactionism, as well as the three uh, actual socioeconomic models that um, actually exist in the world of capitalism, socialism, and communism, which sort of follow conflict theory and functionalism as their guiding principles. Uh, but first, let's talk about conflict theory. Conflict theory was started by Karl Marx, the guy who wrote the Communist Manifesto. And he said that the world is in conflict. There are the people that have and the people that don't have. Uh, he called these the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie are the people that have, and the proletariat are the working class. So the, work, the proletariat are the ones that, and this is according to him, that actually generate the stuff. They're the ones working in the factories. They're the ones grinding at jobs. And the bourgeoisie are the ones that own things. He said the bourgeoisie, or you could think of them as company owners, um, managers, but, but owners, the ones that own, and the bourgeoisie, the ones that work. Uh, and he said this is inherently not a fair system because the proletariat are the ones that are actually grinding and doing the work in a business. And then the, the bourgeoisie are the ones that are primarily making the money from the business. So uh, he's, the bourgeoisie leverage their own, the, the work of the proletariat, basically compensate them less than their work is worth in order to make more money. And he said this is an unfair system. And he said the best possible outcome would be communism. Uh, he wrote the Communist Manifesto after all. And communism is complete equality. So he said, let's just let's just throw it out. Let's just get rid of it. Let's get rid of the proletariat. Let's get rid of the bourgeoisie. We'll just make everyone equal. Um, complete equality. So you don't have to you don't have to buy. You're given food. Uh, you can think of it sort of as if like parks, parks that are so you just go to your nearest park and who who's allowed to go to the park anybody who owns the park I mean, you can kind of think of it as a, several different ways you could think of it like the government owns the park which is true probably the way he would like to phrase something like that is the people own the park so he would say um the people ought to own the companies which that's how he would phrase it in in reality it would, it would more be like the government that owns the, the companies but then uh they the people work in the companies and there's not really wealth inequality he it is forcibly equal complete communism uh he said that the proletariat should overthrow the bourgeoisie and he was he was actually okay with violent revolt he said um it is such an unfair unequal system that it is worth violent revolt uh or or um, sudden change. Sudden change is good. We should overthrow the system. He used very dramatic words like that. Overthrow the system. Um, in fact, the last line of the Communist Manifesto is, workers of the world unite. You have nothing to lose but your chains. So you can see, dramatic guy, but he believed passionately in the evils, in his words, of this unequal system, and he believed that the working class or the proletariat were being taken advantage of by the bourgeoisie so that they could um, make money off of the backs of the working class, and it's bad. Cool. That's Karl Marx. Um, conflict theory. Conflict theory, named appropriately because he thought that uh, the current system is in conflict, and there are people that have, don't have, the people that have want more. The, the people that don't have are being kind of stolen from uh, into the pockets of the people that already have. Conflict theory. Functionalism uh, was created by Emily Durkheim, and she would view kind of the exact same system in a very different way. She uh, would, I guess, agree with Karl Marx that there is inequality, but she would say that's a beneficial thing. And inequality is good. And we have these systems in place. She would say, like, the church is a system. In fact, Karl Marx, very, he did not like the church. He thought the church was oppressive, and it was uh, the opiate of the masses, he called it. It was a way to um, make the proletariat or the workers kind of tamp them down and make them be able to work more happily and, and keep them from revolting. So he, he was not a fan of the church. Emily Durkheim said, church, great. Uh, and, there's, and the family system, great. All these systems are beneficial to society. And she says, sure, there's inequality, but uh, it 
it works and, and we, it is necessary to the economic success of society. And she'd say, yes, there are, she wouldn't call it proletarian bourgeoisie, but she would say, yes, there are people that own the company, there are workers in the company, there are consumers, um, and this is all a, a good system. In fact, it's a self-correcting system. Like what happens, let's just take McGinnis. Uh, there, are, there are people that are paid, there are, there are staff that are paid more, there are staff that are paid less. Um, there are people that enroll, there are the parents of people that enroll. What happens if you try to, let's say next year, we try to double the tuition charge to McGinnis? What's gonna happen? You're gonna have a lot of people drop out. Uh, it's a self-correcting system. If you try and charge, if, you, if one of the pieces of the system is out of whack, it kind of corrects itself. So if we try and double tuition, well, you're going to have people drop out and you're going to lose money. Um, if you're not nice to your employees, your employees are going to quit. So it's, it's this system that kind of fixes itself. The free market is re regulates things and this inequality uh, is kind of also a self-correcting system. If, if people in a, in a company are paid way too much, if the owner of the company is making 95% of the wealth of the company and they're not paying their workers enough, they're not going to have workers because the workers are not going to agree to work for that for that company. So she would say that uh, sure it's unequal, but it's the it's a good system. Uh, Karl Marx would say we should have rapid revolt. We should have like um, fundamental change is good. She'd say no 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 slow change. Sure you can do that. You can tinker with some stuff in the system. So our our American capitalist system. Yeah sure we can raise taxes a little bit. We can lower taxes a little bit. Uh, we could maybe do some minimum wage stuff, but, but for the most part, leave it alone. Uh, don't change fundamental capitalism, would say Durkheim for functionalism. Karl Marx would say, no, 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 throw the whole thing out. We need to start from scratch. That's what Karl Marx would say. So based the, the boil down is conflict theory. Uh, he said, uh, capitalism, bad. We should have communism where everyone is equal. Functionalism would say capitalism, good. And sure, it's not equal, but that's not a bad thing necessarily. And it's the best thing that exists. Moving on to symbolic interactionism. Symbolic interactionism, uh, kind of oddly, in sociology, in any, any sociology textbook, it is in this same list of three theories, but it, at least in my mind, has nothing to do with the other two. But symbolic interactionism does not talk about economics really at all. It just says we interpret the world through symbols. So everything we do is a symbol. Um, in fact, this, this thing on my, my finger right here is a symbol. And it doesn't mean anything other than that there's a little bit of metal on my finger. But we all agree that it means that I'm married. Uh, let's see. If you point at somebody, we agree that that symbol means you're pointing at somebody. If you use the next finger, that's the finger you're not supposed to use. That's mean. If you use the thumb, that means good job. These are all, they don't mean anything. But we all agree that they mean things. Words, even. Words are symbols, and we all agree that they have meaning. Um, and uh, and that's it. So that, that's what kind of makes language that what allows us to communicate with each other, is we agree upon the meaning of things. Um, let's talk about capitalism, socialism, and communism. Uh, capitalism is... They're, they're actually more complicated... Well, they're more complicated and more simple, sort of, than than you'd think, but functionalism was sort of the ideal. Uh, the ideal is capitalism, unregulated capitalism, I guess. And communism is the ideal according to conflict theory. Socialism is, is sort of somewhere in between. Let me briefly talk about capitalism, socialism, and communism. Capitalism is the freest of the, the three, depending on what you mean by free, I guess, but you are more able to if you start a bit, you're able to start a business, you can own that business, you can charge whatever you want for a product. If you charge too much, you're probably not going to sell it. If you charge too little, you're not going to make enough money, but you can kind of do whatever you want in capitalism. That does mean, however, that you can have people with tremendous wealth and you can have people with tremendous poverty, <coughs> but there's a lot of freedom. You can own whatever you want. You want to own 15 cars? Fantastic. Sounds good. Good for you. You want to own five houses? Wonderful. Good on you. Uh, but capitalism, it is what America is, although America is not pure capitalism. There is not really a country that is. We have regulated capitalism. So pure capitalism, capitalism is regulated by the free market. So if, uh, 
in supply and demand. So what, what determines the price of a gallon of milk in a capitalist society? Well, that depends how much milk we have and how much milk people want. Because if we start to get a milk shortage, then more people want milk than we have of milk, and the price of milk goes up. Uh, if we have, well, right now at least, with gasoline, if we have a whole bunch of gasoline and no one's actually using it, then the price of gas goes down because there's a ton of it and no one actually wants it. And that's what's happening right now, and that's as a result of capitalism and, and the supply and demand. Socialism. People mean 17 different things when they say socialism. There's uh, technically, the definition of socialism is the government owns the means of production. But it, it is, the, the government owns companies, they own um, the means to produce goods. Even in America, we don't think of ourselves as a socialist country. However, we have lots of socialist institutions. Public school, socialist institution. The government owns the public school. It's not a for-profit company. It's a socialist company, kind of, is public schools. The police department is a socialist institution. Fire department, socialist. Who makes the roads that we drive on, other than the turnpike? But the public roads is kind of a socialist institution. Police department, uh, US Postal Service, socialist. And um, we don't have a pure capitalist medical system, but we also don't have a socialist medical system. It's somewhere in a weird middle, but there are lots of countries with a socialist medical system. So the government kind of oversees the medical system and it doesn't aim to make a profit. And in America, it's in a weird tangle between all sorts of things, but we kind of used to have a capitalist medical system, but it gets so complicated. But socialism is the government owns companies and it has increased regulation but you still work for companies and you can still make money and with that money you can still buy things so if you want to own two cars in a socialist country great um, there's going to be less wealth inequality so there's going to be less hugely ridiculously wealthy people that will be able to buy these things, but uh, it'll be more equal, but not completely equal. Communism, theoretically, is complete equality. So um, you would kind of need to institute a socialist government structure to own all of the means of production. So uh, McDonald's would not exist in a pure socialist country <coughs> or a communist country. And there's, socialist is kind of on a continuum. There's more socialist and less socialist countries. And you could argue that America is already a socialist country to some degree. And, and even the countries that say that they're communist aren't truly communist at all. In fact, some of them are even more capitalist than America. The ones that say they're communist, China's a good example. China says they're a communist country. They, as far as I could tell, they're not really much of a communist country at all. In some ways, they're actually more capitalist. They, you can sell things and charge things with even less regulation than, than America, but they say they're communist. But pure communism would be, there would be no ownership of, you certainly wouldn't own your house, and there'd be really no ownership of things. Everything would kind of be like a public park, sort of where you don't own the house that you're in, the people own the house that you're in, which in practice really means the government owns the house that you're in. So you don't own your house, you probably don't own your car. You don't, depending on what we mean by communism, you maybe don't even own your food, you're given your food, but uh, everyone has the same stuff. So it is completely equal, but there's much, much, much less freedom. So let's go through the this little thing here. In capitalism, and if we were in class, I would just ask you and we'd kind of talk this through, but I'll, I'll just uh, sort of fill it in for you here. Who owns stuff in capitalism? You do. You can own whatever the heck you want, unless you're poor, then you can't afford it. But uh, if you want to buy an apple, great, go down to Crest, buy an apple. You want to buy a car? As long as you can afford it, you can have it. Socialism, you can still own stuff. Um, there's going to be less extremely wealthy people. Communism, Depending on what you mean by stuff, 
you cannot own stuff. You can have stuff, but you don't own the stuff. Equality. Capitalism is extremely unequal. There are very rich people and very poor people. Emily Durkheim would say that's perfectly fine. Karl Marx would say that's terrible. In socialism, there is more inequality, or sorry, there is more equality, but not complete equality. And in communism, theoretically, there is complete equality. Uh, everybody in a communist country, theoretically, ought to have the exact same level of stuff and wealth. Now, in practice, it almost never works that way. And, um, but at least in theory, that's the way it ought to work. Capitalism, who owns your house? You do, if you own your house. If you rent your house, I guess the bank owns it. Socialism, who owns your house? Uh, probably you do. Communism, who owns your house? The government, or Karl Marx would say, the people. Distribution of wealth in capitalism. Uh, it is very unequal. So uh, there are very wealthy people and very un un poor people. Socialism, distribution of wealth is um, much more equal and, and communism is completely equal. Kind of similar just to the equality thing I already gave here. Country example of capitalism would be the United States, supposedly, although we're, we're kind of a hybrid of capitalism and socialism. Socialism would be, there's a lot of European countries that are socialists, like uh, Denmark, Sweden, as well as Canada is more socialist than we are because they have a socialist medical system. Communism. Uh, China says they are. I don't... I mean, I, I, North Korea is probably more of a communist system with a dictator than China is, but it, it all gets kind of fuzzy. Uh, business ownership. In capitalist society, you can own your business. You want to start a business? You want to sell stuff? Great. Sell it. Got to get a permit probably, but you, you can sell those things. Socialist. It depends what kind of business and what you mean by socialist. In a strongly socialist country, you probably can't own very much in a business um, because the means of production are owned by the government. But it, it depends. It depends what kind of business is the answer. Communist, there's no, you don't own business. The government owns the business or the people on the business. What determines prices in capitalist society is the free market. So if uh, we have a milk shortage, the price of that milk whoosh, is gonna go up. Socialist, they are more likely to fix prices. So if there's a milk shortage, the price of milk stays the same. And the result of that is they're gonna sell out of milk. So you won't be able to buy the milk because it won't be there, but it will be the same price. Communist society, they're kind of, depending on what you mean by communist, they kind of aren't prices, but it all depends on what you mean by communist. In a pure communist society, actually for the project we're going to do, it means you just kind of share your stuff. If you uh, have wheat, you just kind of like, you take as much wheat as you need and then you give the rest away. And so you don't really need money in a pure communist society. Now in practice, that's never actually worked but theoretically, that would be the case. Um, and that's it.